artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 207. I have a huge treat for you today. My guest is a star of the intersection of time management and philosophy, Oliver Berkman, author of the best-selling self-help book, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals, and former author of the psychology column, This Column Will Change Your Life, in The Guardian. Now, on the face of it, that may not sound like much of a connection with AI, but actually, I think it is one of the most important, perhaps even the most important, connections with AI, so much so that it was the theme of my 2020 TEDx talk, How to Save Us from Being Left Behind by AI. Our relationship with time is, in broad terms, dysfunctional. Most of us can attest to being severely overworked and with a shrinking amount of personal time left over. This is true despite the introduction into our lives of a huge amount of technology from the PC to the internet. Why have tools like email, Google, and instant messaging not reduced our workload and stress? In fact, it's not hard to believe that they are responsible for making those things worse. Certainly, we wouldn't have to go far to find ample evidence of that. In which case, I have to ask, what effect will unleashing AI which accelerates everything it touches, on our work life, have? Do we have the right to expect that it will make our lives less harried? Where would you be willing to bet? What if it's not the development in technology that determines how much less or more stressful our lives become, but our collective relationship with time? Doesn't that now become of primary importance in charting our course towards a future goal of finally relaxing and experiencing life and work with ease. And that is exactly what Oliver writes about in his work, and in particular in 4,000 Weeks. And he has a unique take on the whole topic of time management that is now of urgent interest to all of us. So let's get right to it. Oliver Berkman, it's a great pleasure to have you here, selfishly, I might add, because your writing has changed my life considerably in opening my eyes to ways in which I had been deceiving myself with respect to my relationship with time. And the story you told that made that difference real for me most immediately was about the parable of the rocks in the jar. And I wonder if, in the hope that someone listening here might derive the same epiphany from that that I did, you could honor us by repeating that lesson for us. Certainly. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And of course, all this stuff that I write about when it comes to time and dealing with the truth of limitation is me working out my own issues and hang-ups and always being gratified to find that there are lots of other people seem to be uh, messed up in the same way. The story of the rocks in the jar, I mean, the, the original canonical story is one that is repeated in all sorts of time management advice books. I think the earliest version is in a book by Stephen Covey from several decades ago now. The basic idea, the version that I know, is that it's a parable about, I think, a college professor, say, who arrives in his class one day carrying some large rocks, some pebbles, some sand, and a big glass jar. And the challenge that he issues to the students is to fit all of those items into the glass jar. And they first of all try putting the sand in first, and then they find that the rocks and the pebbles won't fit, and then they try putting the pebbles in, and then the sand, and then the big rocks won't fit. And he demonstrates that the only way to make everything fit into the jar is first of all to put the big rocks in there, and then everything else sort of nestles in the gaps between them, but you have to put the big rocks in first. The metaphor here is that the big rocks are your major priorities in life, the things that really matter. And you have to make time for those as the first thing that you do. And that if you do that, then you can fit other things in too, but you will find time for what really counts. If you leave them, if you do all the other stuff first, if you think about prioritize all the other stuff first, you'll never get 
to those big rocks. And something had always bothered me about this story, and it was in researching my book, 4,000 Weeks, where I sort of figured it out and was able to express it, which is pretty obviously just that the whole thing is rigged, right? Because the professor has only brought into the classroom the number of big rocks that he knows can be made to fit into the jar. So he's effectively assuming, to use the analogy, that there must be some way to make time for all the things in life that feel like they're really important. There's no room in this story, in this demonstration, for what I think is probably really the truth, especially in the modern era, but arguably it's just in the human condition, which is that there are just many more things that feel like they matter than there's any reason to believe we'll have time for, right? There's like a huge additional pile of big rocks off to the side that are never going to get anywhere near the jar. And I think that sort of basic idea that we sort of assume that there's some sort of natural law that if something feels important, then there must be a way to fit it in. And a lot of kind of time management advice is about optimization and efficiency. The fundamental idea there is usually that you can minimize or eradicate all the stuff that doesn't really matter so that you can do all the things that matter. And I think we're in a worse situation than that. I think there isn't time for all the things that matter. And I think that inevitably focusing in on a few things that really count means sacrificing, not doing, waving goodbye to a whole lot of things that would have been perfectly legitimate uses of our time. But that's what makes the choices tough choices rather than easy ones. And I'm still processing this because I got angry and I'm still angry. And the way that I thought about this was, well, I went back in time wanting some gender stereotyping ahead here, but I thought back 30 years or so and to a time when I imagined myself and others looking at our spouses, watching Martha Stewart and thinking, oh, you poor sap, you've been duped by a guru preying upon your insecurities to drag you down a road driven by your own perfectionism that you can never reach the goal of how fortunate I am not to be in that position. When it only <laughs> took me another 30 years plus your book to realize that I and everyone else saying that was in exactly the same position with respect to the time management gurus who were saying, if you find the right system, if you do everything I'm telling you to and you get it perfect, then you will reach perfection. You will reach the nirvana of having everything done. You will be able to make it all work. And mm -hmm. then, then you'll just be sitting on a beach somewhere and in a state that only those people ever seem to embody. And the rest of us, when we didn't get there, it was just, well, you haven't worked the system enough. Buy my next right. book, take my next workshop, yeah. keep going. And I mm -hmm. was on that hamster wheel for a long time, and I can still feel it going around, around me, making me dizzy. So, and let me just, yeah, let me just interject <laughs> briefly to say, me too. And part of the book I wrote is about sort of grappling with being uh, recovering time management obsessive, but also to some extent, even to this day, I think I've seen through it. And I think I'm more aware of what I'm up to when I fall into that way of thinking. But there's something incredibly seductive about the kind of control that seems like it ought to be possible in that way. And, you know, a little part of me is always searching for the perfect productivity system that's going to render everything completely smoothly functioning and enable me to handle absolutely everything that's thrown at me and never have to say no to anything. I know. I'm still doing it out of <laughs> momentum, if nothing else, but still a, a huge amount of internal belief structures. We'll get to the AI connection shortly, but I want to take our time here and take this opportunity to ask you how you got from being, I think, journalist to what one might term a guru on the Zen of time. <laughs> one might. Not sure what I think about that. The answer is really that I worked primarily for the Guardian newspaper, first on staff and then as a freelancer for many years. And what I sort of one of the main things I did during that time was to write a weekly column in the Saturday magazine. 
with the title, This Column Will Change Your Life, which was meant to be a joke, but I ended up having to explain this to many people for many years. It really that arose from a canny editor of mine who saw that I was reading these kinds of books anyway, and we had this sort of guilty interest in self-help, time management, and all the rest of it, and thought she might as well get some content out of it. And on the one hand, I sort of embarked on that with a very sort of sardonic, like I was going to satirize all the rubbish, and there is plenty of rubbish in the field, obviously. But I think even at the beginning of that, it went on for like more than a decade, I read that column. Even at the beginning of that, I sort of knew that I was very compelled by this subject matter. I don't think there's anything dishonorable about wanting to help oneself or wanting to organize one's time or figure out how to reach one's goals. It's just that a lot of the purported ways of doing it are actually a really interesting demonstration of what's wrong rather than the path to a solution. So I just sort of went deeper and deeper into this and then wrote a book about problems with positive thinking called The Antidote. And then most recently, 4,000 Weeks about sort of grappling with what it means to be a finite human being. And I've just really always enjoyed, I guess, straddling that boundary between philosophy and self-help and quoting Heidegger, but also David Allen and anybody else in the same breath. I take quite a lot of pleasure in the thought that probably there are people out there who are just appalled at how unscholarly it is or something. But I think that instinct underlying self-help is a decent one. So it's interesting to Mm. Go down that road. What was the reception like to that work? I mean, I came across you first on the Sam Harris podcast, which is a certain altitude of right. public exposure. So how was the book received in general? This book, 4,000 Weeks, has been totally unlike anything I've been involved in before. I've had a previous book and then actually in the UK alone, another book, which was a collection of columns. So it's not my first time going through the publication and book launch process, but it's just, I don't know exactly why. I think part of it is to do with the timing. I think not very deliberately. I think coming out of the pandemic, there was a real sort of moment of reconsideration about what people were doing with their time. Who knows what the other factors are, but anyway, it's been very positive and by my standards, very big compared to anything I'd experienced before. So I love that. It's slightly overwhelming. It's kind of brilliant to realize that, as I said at the beginning, there's so many people seem to share these pathologies of time management. A very common thing that people say now in emails and things is like, it's like you're inside my head. And I'm like, it's amazing because all I was doing was trying to put the clearest words I could on what was inside my head, really. So. And is it leading you to develop it further? Is the world asking for more? I mean, I'm just working on another book at the moment, which is sort of a collection of shorter essays, I guess. Is the world asking for more? I mean, on some level, I don't know. I think so, or some small portion of the world. I think this topic of what the ramifications are of being finite as a human is, ironically enough, basically limitless. And the very specific lens that I was looking at that was using in that book about time is only one part of the equation, right? I think there's all sorts of different ways in which we basically spend our lives trying to not feel the fact of being finite. Mm. And yeah, it feels like there's plenty more there. And I keep being sent recommendations for things to read or authors and philosophers to track down. And you get a bigger sense of how these different avenues of thought have explored this stuff. So yeah, it feels like there's a lot to keep going with. Well, let's talk about how technology affects this, because it seems to bring in another parable, the one about the drunkard who's searching for his car keys under the lamppost, not because that's where he lost them, but because that's where the light is. Yeah. That we look to technology as being the light, but our keys are somewhere else. And I've got statistics, like for instance, the average American married couple worked just over 68 hours per week in 1880. And in 1965, it was 67 hours. And in 2000, it was 67 hours. And in 2020, it's 67 hours. It's not changed at all. It's shifted some from the men to the women, but the figures for the couple have not budged at all. And contrast that with John Maynard Keynes predicting that we wouldn't need to work at all, or maybe 15 hours a week. 
we're not getting any closer to that. And to many people, it feels like we're getting further away. But if you went back to the 1880s and described the kind of technology that we have now, they would think that we should be in that era of not having to work. How do you feel technology impacts our relationship with time? Wow, yeah. Well, I mean, that question, as you just finished by phrasing it there, is obviously huge, and there are a million different directions we could go. But I think the one that is the place to start is is this thing that I call the efficiency trap, but it goes by lots of other different names and is not a new observation with me, certainly, which is that there's a sort of basic pattern arising in all sorts of different domains that if you make a system more efficient and you are a system, you know, personal productivity is a system, then all else being equal, the result is that more inputs rush to fill the system and you end up just as full of things to do, just as busy or overwhelmed as you were in the first place. So the example that I'm always like to give is email. If you start answering your email at a quicker tempo because you really decide you're going to get on top of email, then obviously you reply to more people and they reply to you and you have to reply to those replies and you get a reputation in your workplace as being really responsive on email. So more people email you and you find this kind of in all sorts of areas, right? It's been said that the reward for good time management is more work. If the incoming supply of something is effectively infinite, there's no limit to the number of emails you might receive or things your boss might ask you to do or ambitions you might have for your small business or any number of things, then getting faster at processing things, if that's all you do, is just going to mean that you end up processing many more of them and also sort of making worse decisions about which ones to admit into your world as well, right? This doesn't apply necessarily to every kind of work, but any sort of knowledge work where you have some autonomy over which projects you accept and don't. If you're pursuing this idea in the back of your mind that you're eventually going to get on top of everything and that there ought to be a way to fit everything in and that you can always just get more efficient to handle more input, then it's going to be a lot easier to say yes to things that you ought to say no to because you're not going to be holding them to the standard that they should meet in order to become part of your world. So I think in that sense, I spoke just then about becoming more personally efficient at dealing with email. But obviously email, as opposed to snail mail, is a good example of a technology that reduces friction, makes it a lot easier and cheaper to receive and reply to messages. And as a result, there are vastly more messages to deal with. And I can just about remember time before email. I think, I guess I was a kid as well. So I don't know how much of it was that and how much of it was that it wasn't in widespread use, but I think it wasn't. And people seem to manage <laughs> to get their work done and to coordinate with each other. Now, obviously, it permits certain things that were not possible before. But I think Cal Newport has done some interesting writing on the relationship between personal productivity and macroeconomic productivity, or rather the lack of much discernible relationship. It doesn't seem to make economies more productive, that people are much more fixated on becoming more productive. So that's the general pattern, I think. Mm. It reminded me of the fact that the more freeways they build in Los Angeles, the more clogged they get. And that's not just some sort of satirical snarking, there's mathematics behind right. it, which yeah, is exactly no. the principle that you outlined. Fascinating. Yes, it's called induced demand, yes. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just, by adding a lane to a freeway, you make it more appealing to more drivers who would otherwise not have used it. There's something called the Jevons paradox in economics, which, and they're not all identical, these things, but they're the same basic idea that efficiency gains in energy efficiency gains in appliances and technologies lead to a greater usage of the underlying right. supply of energy because cheaper per unit. But now looking at email, we are on the cusp of what could be some kind of explosion in the amount of information we are asked to process because we can be getting emails from AIs. We could be getting emails sent from someone's personal AI. This is a goal of artificial intelligence research at the moment to produce what's effectively a clone of a person. This has been expressed by many of my guests that they foresaw and were looking forward to AI being able to reproduce enough of their functions that it would take care of their menial tasks behind the scenes, sort of like a digital butler. And it's enormously appealing. 
but it also demands that everyone else get one as well. Otherwise, you'll never be able to keep up with the amount of output that everyone else is now generating. And then there is this prospect that induced demand will yeah. only make it worse instead of better. Is this something that if you put on a forward-looking futurist hat, haul out the crystal ball, do you see trends in the way that we develop our relationship with the amount of work that we have to do? I mean, certainly you use the example of how medieval peasants didn't feel this sort of thing at all. So there's been some movement since then. Do you see any other movement? It's fascinating. I feel like the world probably divides into people who think about the scenario you sketched out and look forward to it, as you said, and people who it sounds like a nightmare. And I'm probably on the latter category. Just at a very first approximation, the things that we've been talking about here so far would seem to point to the idea that, well, firstly, if you're talking about AI tools taking on the menial stuff to free up the time for the stuff that only humans can do, and obviously maybe that's a brief flash in the pan before there's nothing left that only humans can do, but let's talk in that sort of immediate sense. The first and obvious thought there is that in the economic system that we exist in, if more of my bandwidth is freed up to do the things that need me to do them because all sorts of other stuff is being handled by artificial intelligence, then it would be predictable that I would end up having to do many more of those things, that that bandwidth would be filled, that the sort of competitiveness of the sector in which I'm in would just readjust so that I'm as busy as I ever was operating at maximum capacity. Now, it might in some ways be more interesting work in that respect, but the idea that it's going to sort of be the thing, I don't see any reason in terms of that sort of near-term sense of what AI is doing and can do. I don't see any reason to think that that violates the law here, <laughs> that, um, that we're just going to get more and more of it. I suppose within the specific domain of like, what if we have these entities emailing with each other and not involving us, then at some point, I mean, like, fine, they can do it among themselves and we can leave them to it. And obviously the volume there is not an issue, right? I mean, if a hundred of my emails can be automatically answered in a few minutes by a technology, then hundreds of thousands of them can be answered in seconds. But it's the possibility, though, of how much goes along with that in terms of the care and feeding. Like with email, yeah. I have to occasionally clean out my spam folder. Yeah. This is not something that would have made sense to my father, right. who didn't do email at all. Right. And I think of the spam handling as being something that saves me time, but it all looks like a time sink compared to him not having to deal with it at all. Right. And so it doesn't take much for these tools that save us time in one way to cost us more in right. others. Like I'm going to have to tune my models at some point and spend time doing that. Yeah, that's another way. I mean, I focused just before on the idea of the freed up bandwidth filling up, but also there's the overheads and the maintenance side of that and the way that one could expect that as well to be susceptible to the same pattern because things are going to advance and those sort of demands on the human involved to guide or to calibrate, to do whatever needs to be done is going to expand as the capacities expand. Yeah, I think that's right. In some ways, it's like anyone who's worked with an assistant or had to sort of brief someone like a designer or a programmer, there's serious overheads involved in sort of making sure that people who are doing things on your behalf or in your employ are doing them in the best way. And then, you know, it's just another version of bureaucracy, right? The desire that we humans are always going to feel to be in control of what's going on, to have some kind of transparency or visibility over those processes imposes its own cost. I don't know. I mean, I have all sorts of thoughts about this way of working and what is lost when it's the more that is automated as well as what is gained. But I do think that that basic point that there is no reason to believe that it just sort of in some absolute way puts a ceiling on our workloads, frees up our time in the way that Keynes thought it would years ago, that I don't see anything different, relevantly different in AI as I understand it that's going to stop that happening because that ultimately is, well, it's human nature and it's capitalism and those seem to be constants here. That's the end of the first half of the interview. In addition to our usual self-imposed limits on time and bandwidth, I want us to have some time, <laughs> I guess that's a bit of a self-referential joke, 
to digest that part before we come back and finish this next week. I got back recently from speaking at the Atlantic conference in Ireland, where I made this a major theme of my keynote, challenging the technical audience to look deeply at how they can use AI to really save us time and not just spin the hamster wheel faster. We should be stressing our technology, not the other way around. By the way, huge thanks to the Galway crew for bringing me there, where I also enjoyed moderating a panel on the future of AI. Just to continue this a bit longer, a study on Japanese replacement birth rate shows that the Japanese race will become extinct within a few hundred years. Of course, we might have other things to worry about in the interim, but this is still important. The entity one would expect to most be concerned about this trend, the Japanese government has been trying for years to encourage more young people to marry and have children, and these efforts are failing because of the Japanese culture of overworking. The drive to prove yourself at work by putting in countless overtime hours is so fanatical that they literally have a word for the phenomenon of being found dead at your desk. They call it karoshi, death from overwork. In other words, they would rather work so hard that they kill not only themselves, but their entire culture. Now the Chinese are seeing the same thing. They've gone within a couple of generations from a country that forbade couples to have more than one child to one where the population is declining so fast that they are begging couples to have as many children as possible. This is driven by the same dedication to work that drives out the time to have relationships and families. Don't think that this obsession is confined to just those countries, or I wouldn't bring it up. It's trivially easy to see that same culture in the United States, for instance, where it's been taking root since the Puritans. And now you can see the ethos of business first, everything else last or not at all, all over. We are collectively sick when it comes to our relationship with time, and we need all the help we can get from people like Oliver. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI and somewhat appositely from The Guardian, a study found that workplace AI, robots, and trackers are bad for the quality of life. I know it sounds like I chose this just for this episode, and I would have, but I didn't have to. It was top of the list anyway. The study from the Institute for the Future of Work surveyed over 6,000 people to analyze the impact of four groups of technologies, and the authors found that the more workers were exposed to technologies in three of those categories, software based on AI and machine learning, surveillance devices such as wearable trackers and robotics, the worse their health and well-being tended to be. By contrast, use of more long-established information and communication technologies, ICTs, such as laptops, tablets, and instant messaging at work, tended to have a more positive effect on well-being. Editorial note, I might disagree, but I'm just going to relay the findings of this survey. The report said, quote, We found that quality of life improved as the frequency of interaction with ICTs increased, whereas quality of life deteriorated as frequency of interaction with newer workplace technologies rose, end quote. While the authors did not directly investigate the causes, they pointed out that their findings were consistent with previous research. Lead author Dr. Magdalena Sofia said, quote, Such technologies may exacerbate job insecurity, workload intensification, routinization, and loss of work meaningfulness, as well as disempowerment, and loss of autonomy, all of which detract from overall employee well-being. End quote. Of course, other big news has been the release of OpenAI's latest model, GPT-4.0, where the O stands for Omni, a model that can interact seamlessly through audio and video, and, as the Daily Show's Desi Lydic pointed out, its voice tone and word choices are very friendly. Very, very friendly. Now, three weeks ago, you may remember me talking about Jon Stewart's commentary on AI on The Daily Show when I chided him for a few cheap shots, so maybe you think I'm about to do the same. Not a bit of it. This Daily Show piece, which was hysterically funny, go watch it, hit a richly deserved target. Omni's voice is indeed as sultry and male fantasy fulfilling as they depicted it, and you didn't have to work at all to draw the conclusion that this was an attempt to reproduce Samantha from the movie Her, because Sam Altman said so in a tweet when it was released. 
Now, about seven years ago, the Me Too movement and several researchers tore into Amazon, Apple and others for releasing digital assistants like Alexa and Siri that defaulted to female voices that would, as one commentator put it, react to sexual harassment with catch-me-if-you-can flirtation. What that meant was that if you called Siri a slut, she'd respond with, I'd blush if I could. And in the demo of Omni, which I'm not going to claim is that bad, one of the demonstrators praised her skills, and she literally giggled and said, Stop it, I'm blushing. So OpenAI walked into this one with their eyes wide open, and the piece on The Daily Show is very valid commentary. Next week, we'll conclude the interview with Oliver Berkman, when we'll talk about whether this is Luddism, the influence of the Silicon Valley billionaire's pursuit of immortality, the appropriate use of AI to save us time, and what will remain constant throughout any amount of technological evolution. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.